Uh, hello, everyone. This is April 25th, uh, Beehive Production Users Call. Within the attendees, we have uh, John, Antronique, Michael's Jedi Ghost, uh, Hans, Andy, Chris, Jan. Greetings, everyone. Uh, for today's topic, we have apparently a uh, Bugzilla uh, link, as far as I can tell. And uh, it's about... Come on, internet connection. Don't embarrass me right now. I think you can do this. Is it even working? Can anybody hear me? We see your uh, screen, but my screen. The okay. Bugzilla is slow. To yeah, it is, it is just slow. There's yeah. been some problem. Uh, there. Okay, there we go. Uh, AMD I on a new BF tester fails with. Oh, I've seen this one. Yeah, that's been going back and forth, really, is to see uh, pass through with SRIOV. Oh, exactly. The terrible thing about it is that depending on unknown conditions, it triggers every few minutes to days. Oh. So uh, a low load system can uh, actually run for a while before it totally freezes up. Yeah, we got an update. Do we uh, know today. what AMD systems this is on? Is it on all of them? It's um, not on mine. I can tell you that by Epic uh, second generation, I think. So, um, not Naples. Okay. Oh, what I was just the saw name? Epic so by the, there. Yeah, the that's the most commonly reported one, at least. Mm, interesting. The one that that's we unfortunate. Have, I'm uh, looking at getting one. Um, it's really the problem that uh, it looks like the I.O. MMU driver is incomplete, buggy, who knows? And someone has to get in touch with AMD on how to read the documentation. Okay. Uh, we have this one, the 7702 uh, 64 core system. We have two of it, actually. Like two, the, I don't know if anybody else is, but I'm having I think a it's... real hard time hearing you. Oh, really? Yeah, you're very quiet to me. Well, you should tell that to my family because they say that I scream usually. Okay. Um, uh, but you? your microphone is the relevant party. Yeah, I think I think I, I modified the MIDI controller. How is it now? Much better. better. Thank you. Yep. Great. Okay. I have this one, the 7702, the 64 core. It's a, we have a dual socket system. And we do use PCI pass-through with a lot of things like... Uh, a GPU as well as uh, network cards from the FreeBSD host to Linux jails, and we haven't had any issues. If anyone, the thing to... is, yeah, Anthony, are you are you using SRIOV as well? I am using SRIOV as well. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Because it's a combination, really. I think. Yeah. That's... yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 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 like when we saw this first, Michael specifically asked me that, "Can you do SRIOV to confirm?" And uh, we did SRIOV and we just left it up and running because it was nice to have that. And uh, we, we don't have any issues with it. And we did it with the onboard NIC as well as the, um, uh, what was the good one with FreeBSD? The Chelsea Onyx as well. So like I was, maybe is it a NIC thing or, or whatever, but no, we haven't had any issues. Uh, maybe I should add that in the post here actually. So people would know, maybe we could narrow it down as far as I can tell. Okay. Anything else? I think the only way we're ever going to get PCI pass through into a state where you can trust it is if someone uh, agrees to run a regression test lab on common hardware. Because that's just not feasible to test all the combinations for every uh, one contributing a patch. Yeah. And there are so many factors that it can explode in your face. So you really have to have a yeah, hardware compatibility lab kind of situation, which is of course not possible to do for the cluster admin team. Um, Or you have to convince lots of users to do a, a grassroots compatibility uh, <laughs> um, testing. Actually, if if I read this correctly, um, if I read this correctly, it it actually begins to appear if you keep 
rebooting your VM. Not sure whether you have done this, Antonik. If I keep rebooting um, the VM, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, we don't From have VMs. They reboot, they reboot like 30 times and then it just keeps screwing oh, no. up apparently. Oh, okay. Um, now nah, that's like an over. No, we've, we've rebooted probably like 10 times yeah, ever since, uh, like in a single run, you know, of the host. But uh, we haven't gone to a 30 as far as I can tell. Maybe I can try that. Maybe I'll do SRIOV to a guest and then just do it fails pass through fails at reboot 32 okay uh intel continues with 3200 34 almost uh okay. successful reboots that, that's been an interesting one 32 is a um, um suggestive number um as a <laughs> small power of two but um if I remember my discussions with Santiago at UBSDCon uh, last fall correctly, uh, it didn't require a reboot uh, to trigger this. It could happen after a few days of uptime without changing the configuration, at least as an operator. Maybe the hardware configuration changed in some way itself, but um, yeah, so it's uh, really a problem and it tended to happen during startup of virtual machines, but mm -hmm. it could also happen uh, during a steady state operation. Um, but it's very likely that not every PCI device triggers this. Maybe it, it takes a nick which runs into what, a certain race condition or uses a certain feature set, who knows? This is really the whether it's known to not reliably work and that's really a problem for such a meta driver. That's interesting. That is interesting indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, okay. But there was no quick and easy reproducer except on systems where it was completely broken for some reason. There was one, uh, I think, super micro and gigabyte board where there was a firmware update and afterward they work as well or not as the rest, but they had shipped the, at least the first revision of the main board with buggy firmware, which was fixed in a BIOS uh, update. John, did you get a chance to work on your uh, Beehive NFS integration? Yeah, I think uh, John actually said he's uh, he's only a fly on the wall today, most likely. So he's probably just here with one ear, I guess. Okay. There I it want... is. I have... Had to yeah. find the mute button. Sorry. <laughs> um, the answer is I have not. Unfortunately, that has turned into a, a lower priority. Um, however, just as a kind of a point of interest, um, I don't know. I'll post this in the chat. I don't know if people have seen. Um, where is the chat for this thing? It always disappears on, on me. There it is. Um, there's a a uh, new NVIDIA GPU, uh, RTX 4000. I don't know if people have seen it, um, but it's only consuming about 70 watts. And I'm, you know, was hoping to try to get one in and see if I could work with it with Beehive, pass it through and have it work. It would be an interesting, much, much less expensive solution. Watt is a W A A T T S, right? Yes. Watt, yeah, yes, absolutely. Or just W if you want to keep it short. Yep. And so, is there a single slot version which can be passively cooled <clears throat> in a high enough uh, airflow uh, chassis? 
because the marketing material you link to has a dual slot, at least a uh, form factor. It would really limit how much you can fit in a reasonably sized uh, server. But just having one uh, small to medium dedicated GPU per virtual machine is a lot easier than having to use uh, virtual functions on a very big GPU. A bit, mm -hmm. a bit off topic. How's uh, how's how's the CUDA API support on on FreeBSD? Because that would also be interesting. Yeah, that is also part of the Enterprise Working Group. Welcome. Okay, uh, I feel your pain. Yeah. That is um, that's a bit of a difficult thing because um, the only way to get actually to this CUDA compatibility is to look back at the DRM KMOD work mm -hmm. that is being done to pull in the uh, the Linux drivers. Yeah, and um, it will probably take quite a bit more work on uh, Linux KPI and the uh, Linux emulation yeah. layer that we have because there's a lot of stuff missing from what I gather. So if I remember correctly, years ago, someone re um, reported success by just running basically the user land bits from a Linux user land on a FreeBSD kernel, but it's likely that CUDA evolved a lot uh, over time and just requires so much Deeper integration with the kernel now that it's no. Longer I feasible. was gonna ask that. Yeah, like it, it does it. Is that like a lot of Linuxism? Because I know that CUDA is also available yes, on Windows. Definitely. You know? Yeah, but the implementation, as far as I gather, is very Linuxy. Okay, that's that's kind of sad, I guess, as far as I can tell, because it's very weird because they they still publish official drivers for FreeBSD as well as Solaris, uh, and they're gonna still support Solaris till twenty thirty. When's the next, uh, to, you know, Y2K? Uh, 2039, 2038? <laughs> Time to overflow. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's when that that's until when that they're gonna support like Solaris as well. Uh, but I mean, I thought so. That's only graphics. Huh? It's not. It's not, it doesn't implement the CUDA stuff. I had no idea. I thought that they published those too. That makes me very sad. So PCI passed through it is to Linux boxes. And Chris, is 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 the enterprise working group gonna work on that from the uh, uh, community perspective, or is the foundation planning on uh, funding that? To be honest, I'm not really up to speed on that one at the Got moment. It. I I just I just know that, that there was a work stream for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Googling for, I was I was just Googling around for CUDA and FreeBSD, and there's apparently someone who's made stable diffusion work on FreeBSD, which is wow. kind of interesting. And there's there's some CUDA work involved in that. I'm okay. just looking at that. But that's also um, over the Linux emulation layer from what I, from what I see. And I see. Uh, stable diffusion also has slower uh, modes of operation without CUDA. Um, so it could be that they're using to play OpenCL or uh, Vulkan compute shaders or whatever. Probably, uh, yeah. Um, or that the subset they need kind of works. <laughs> could also be interesting. Um, so last time I checked uh, NVIDIA PCI pass through in Beehive, I think it was in on a 1080 Ti. So that was possible, but required some workaround because uh, if you don't initialize the driver and so on, it can't have um, IO port emulation because uh, so for the early startup, you had to uh, configure the Linux or FreeBSD NVIDIA driver to explicitly tell it which PCI ID uh, is the <laughs> video card on a, the guest side, and then the Linux of FreeBSD and video drivers work, but nobody knows if there's such a opportunity even in um, 
in Windows to explicitly configure the driver to attach to a specific PCI ID uh, or enumerate because uh, it isn't the GPU just isn't in the state where it gets auto detected um, by the normal driver uh, code. Well, there's... So that was, I think, 2019-ish or so, so it's a while ago. There is a conversation on the forums where someone is actually claiming that CUDA already works. Um, though I have to admit, I cannot make heads or tails out of that yet. I have to read through the whole thing. It's probably <laughs> nasty. Ah, so yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'll just put this in and there. People well. are calling them out there, but who knows? Uh, I wanted to report that um, our fat scientific server with the two tier frame and the uh, massive storage and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, it's been working for a whole month now without any issues, which has been very, I mean, the scientists are very happy about it because now we can like run jobs that could go for weeks. Um, the common problems were, were the Intel next. There's a bug in there. I've reported it to Intel as well as to uh, the, I think on the bug, the bugzilla as well. I'm not sure. I should check. And we replaced this one. Well, we're still using the Linux. We're just passing them over to the some of the guests because it's, it's working fine and Linux doesn't need that much of a high performance right now. Um, and uh, FreeBSD is using Chelsea cards. And of course, the first issue that we encountered after buying the server was that you know storage was very, very bad, even though it was in JBOD mode in the rate card, but it was just very bad. We changed that to a regular HBA and uh, we haven't had any issues with the storage as well. And Beehive is working flawlessly there. Um, I mean, some of the VMs have like 200 plus cores. Um, in a single VM and like, you know, terabyte of RAM in a single VM. Uh, and it's it's all working fine. However, we are using a lot of um, CPU pinning. We I, I don't know if Michael reported this, but maybe I should have that when we are doing CPU pinning, the system does boot faster. Like we've seen it actually, we've, we've done a, a little bit of benchmarking and saw how that with CPU pinning, Linux boots much, much faster. We're, we're talking like 400% uh, you know, faster, you know. Um, Not so surprising. Yeah, I'm guessing there's a lot of lot of context switching happening at the beginning of the boot process, maybe. I don't know. Um, um, one of the other problems is that um, during boot up and so on, if the cores are intermittently loaded and so on, uh, they tend to just um, move around if they're not pinned. Mm -hmm. And if you have a big Prunuma system, uh, there's your memory just uh, is allocated where you uh, last touched it basically and now uh, you're on the other uh, <laughs> end of the domain, yeah yes exactly you're basically running at the speed uh, of the uh, and latency of your uh, socket interconnect again yeah, yeah. so uh, pinning can really help you there and the guest kernel can't really be smart about being moved around by the hypervisor the um you may be able to overcommit by just making the scheduler a lot more, more um, um, you can configure this default FreeBSD scheduler to be a lot uh, less um, willing to move uh, threads between uh, cores, but that means that the load is not efficiently moved around, which is kind of what you want, but just pinning it and not over committing, of course, gives you the best performance and more important, more or less deterministic performance. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the other things that we have uh, noticed, and again, I'm, I don't remember if I talked about this during the calls, but it might be interesting for other people, is that there we go. Um, there is a, um, a buffer overflow. I mean, it's technically a buffer overflow. Uh, in the sense that if you boot a VM in UEFI and give it more than a terabyte of RAM, 
the first terabyte is going to get discarded. So we booted the VM. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we booted the VM with like 1.5 terabytes and the VM sees only uh, three, five or three, right? So it's like it, okay. it's missing the first uh, 1,024 uh, gigabytes of, of memory. Yeah, and uh, it took us a like... while to figure this out. And this was a real problem because we wanted to... 32-bit page counter. Exactly, yeah, 32-bit bit, bit page counter. We wanted to move the... Um, the uh, one of one of the VMs to UEFI to also have you know a VNC console uh, if needed and uh, that's when we noticed that and so we reverted everything back to uh, uh, well not everything just the fat that's just the fat VMs we reverted them back to uh, non UEFI it doesn't have it doesn't have have any issues when uh, regarding to um, uh, the Grub Beehive or the regular FreeBSD loader by the way. And it's interesting because when you go into the uh, uh, Yarn, which, which, which menu, which, 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 which UEFI firmware were we using? The cute one when it boots up? Uh, uh, the EDK2 one. Uh... Yeah, that one. And when you go to the, when you go to the setup menu, you can actually see it saying like 1,500 something, something gigabytes, you know, of memory. Yeah, and... It sounds like there's a Back in the ACPI memory tables. Could be, yeah, could be that. Um, and uh, Rebecca. In that case, you may even be able to, uh, mm -hmm. just as an experiment or workaround until it's fixed, uh, configure the guest operating system to override that in some way, depending on the oh, operating system, like a flattened device table or something. Yeah. Uh, so a tweak. So that would be really nasty. Uh, so yeah, that's that's also an interesting uh, issue from our uh, side of things. Uh, I think I had a lot to report on our scientific machine. Of course, the biggest problem is still the lack of scientific software. I would love my scientists to use FreeBSD, but you know we're not there yet. And then, then ten minutes later, my engineer would ask me, "Are we there yet?" And I would say, "We're not there yet." And then I would feel like Shrek. So uh, that's that's usually how my day goes with the scientists. Um, did anyone? Sorry. Yeah, sir. Go, go on, Jan. Uh, did anyone look at the nine uh, P uh, driver in FreeBSD? Uh, we tried it, and we had some issues with it when it came to uh, not performance. Performance was fantastic. Uh, we had issues because uh, we add and remove users a lot. Uh, well, not a lot, you know, mm -hmm. once every while. And like you had to reboot the machine because there is like a, um, well, that, uh, wait, I remember we had very specific, a very, very specific issue with it. So uh, everything default worked fine, but then we had like nested, nested ZFS and Inside of then, like unlike NFS, which doesn't work with nested ZFS, specifically NFS three, that doesn't work with nested ZFS. Because as far as I know, it's because the inode number gets reset to zero. Am I right? Is that why why that happens? I'm assuming that's why it happens. Uh, we did not have that issue. However, it did not read the permissions properly in the nested one. So you saw it, you saw the files, but the permissions were all wrong. So we had a very weird issue there. I, I should probably reboot the machine with the P9FS and document it. And uh, so we can probably work on that too. I thought it might be a Linux issue. Uh, so then I booted, uh, there was another operating system with P9FS. I remember I tried an operating system with P9FS. I think I booted Plan 9 itself. And P, okay. I mean, it, it made the most sense as far as I, that was a while ago. Yeah, I think it was. I, yeah. And uh, I looked into it and it had the same issue. So I'm assuming it might be an issue on our side, not on the Linux client side. So, yeah, that's the it, longer story short version. It could be that the, um, the problem is that the 9P protocol is uh, in some ways the opposite of NFS and that it is quite stateful. So you have a session. And then mm -hmm. you uh, open uh, a file and you get a handle to operate on, which is only scoped to that uh, connection. Mm -hmm. So the server kind of has to keep a mapping from handle to file descriptor. And maybe that mapping does not take the device ID into account. Oh. And if the cache contains uh, the, the same inode, maybe it then 
to the CI node. Oh, I know that inode number. Oh, it, could that be. would be a stupid bug. Uh, yeah, because a normal file is not uh, or directory is not uniquely identified by an inode, but only by the combination of device ID and inode. Yeah. Um, yeah, could be that. But yeah, overall, we had that permission issue, which was hard for us because we have scientists who work on like classified data that other people should not have a look at. So we, we, we evaluated the risk and we said as much as we love the performance, maybe when we get more funding, we should hire someone to just fix this problem. And one day we can just ditch NFS completely. Yeah. Uh, but no, we're, we're pretty happy with the current NFS, at least for now. Uh, there are some issues, but it's on the Linux side of things. The FreeBSD hasn't had any issues. Oh, and the performance was awesome on P9FS, like absolutely awesome. Regarding performance, uh, because it came up in recent calls, I looked at the code again of the how Beehive's network uh, backends are implemented. Um, the, and discover that the, while there is a um, I.O. vector for a scatter gather list, it's used for the fragments of a single frame and not uh, for uh, multiple frames. So has anyone looked into extending that API so that it would make, you would see actual performance gains by operating on multiple packets? Maybe you should also have a look into the Illumos side of things because Beehive on Illumos does have better network performance than Beehive on yep. FreeBSD. I'm talking specifically about the ePair bridge part of things. I know that I mean, we've talked about this a lot also on the calls. Um, what's the name of it? Um, Viona. Uh, yeah, that as well as, as, well as um, NetMap. Uh, NetMap um, exists in FreeBSD and not in Solaris, as far as I know. Yes, but NetMap on FreeBSD is really good. My problem with it is that I still can't find proper documentation on how to use it. Like, um, it's it's yeah, th that's been my biggest issue with NetMap. Otherwise, I, I would love to move to how NetMap. to configure a veil switch and attach Beehive to it. Nice. And found out that there isn't a. It's no longer an, an instant kernel panic generator like it was in earlier FreeBSD releases. That has been fixed, but uh, there isn't a giant performance gain. And when you look in the um, NetMap uh, Beehive backend for the VitIO driver, in the VitIO not code, you find that it just uh, yeah. mmaps both the guest uh, VitIO net ring buffer and the NetMap ring buffer, and then does a context switch and a mem copy per packet, and then another. Uh, Context search, and that's exactly why we don't see large performance gains from NetMap, because you have only replaced basically the the read write system call with a mem copy loop. Uh, okay, you saved a little, but uh, you're still going through the whole uh, context switches and code base per packet. If we did it in batches there, there would probably be an instant performance gain. And the next performance gain would be had from uh, implementing a generic segmentation offloading so that you could um, just exchange larger fragments and delay the um, or larger packets and then delay the um, rewriting of the packets into mm. one MTU size packets uh, as far um, away from the um, guest and as close to the hardware as possible. Um, yeah, but still in software. Um, yeah, that was the topic last week. The University of Pisa in 2014 and 15 had someone working on that. And there's an abandoned FreeBSD branch with the code linked to in the minutes from last week. Mm. Um, this is this is by the way something that someone posted, Chris. About sorry, uh, sorry, Chris. I just want to ask, what's Vivado? Is that the uh, tool to work uh, with FPGAs? The, yeah, I think so. That's uh, the, the, actually there's been a couple of those going around lately. But um, this guy apparently uh, tried it to uh, try to run it on the Linux emulation as well as on Beehive. Okay. Um, 
I'm I'm stumped with this. Uh, I would I would expect that the Linux emulation layer does not ex work exactly like a behind Linux virtual machine, but maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken. I don't know. Um, if you've got any uh, or any one of us has got any feedback or any ideas how to reply to this, then hey, by all means, let's have them. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, I'm trying to find the one that where we did the hackathon kind of thing. Hackathon notes on puns. There we go. Because um, the, about the Velus, which Jan, I wanted to add. What is this? Oh, t-shirt ideas. Okay. Yeah, we, we added some of the last time, I think. Yeah, that That's was just... fun. That was really fun. And the fun, a stupidest image that I found in here was this. This was my issue with Veil. How do you do this? Zoom 150%. Zoom 200%. There we go. This is what I had in um, Veil and Ouch. NetMap. Yeah, ouch, double free on buffer, and it, it just keeps doing, you know, plus one. And at some point, it just, uh, this is the message, by the way. And at some point, it just stops, like the whole system, to be more specific. Yeah. So, we yeah, this was our NetMap fun. Ouch, double which, free. Which uh, FreeBSD version was that on? This was on 13.2. The, the, the genomic okay. machine has been upgraded since and... to 14. I should maybe try again on 14. And which, uh, how did you configure uh, Veil? So did, that did, is did a you very good the, question. Because uh, maybe I came up with a different configuration. I should check if I kept proper notes somewhere. Uh, at least I can't uh, tell you what I did exactly because I didn't uh, remember where I put it. Even if I, I probably kept the notes dot txt somewhere <laughs> <laughs> good one uh, um, yeah no i'll go over it i'll go over it i'll, I'll i have i usually set my history size to you know one million um, in order to keep <laughs> these things so i'll go over my history and document that too yes yeah but what i did is i put the physical nick in a pass remote so that it's basically Anything the rail bridge does not uh, consume gets forwarded on the under the name of the physical NIC, and then Veil basically gets a chance to mm. inject frames or take frames mm -hmm. uh, from the queues. And then I had Beehive uh, just create ports on that Veil on the first uh, Veil uh, bridge, mm -hmm. and I it was like. 10 or 15 percent maybe faster than uh, tap uh, with uh, the 1500 byte MTU. Um, so that's nice, but not the game changer I would like to see. So sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's a circle jerk, isn't that? I mean, at least I would say, I mean, what is this? People, people standing around this, and you know, so this is working. Sinist with FreeBSD, nice. Oh my god, this is so good. Also, since when did desktop work on FreeBSD? Why do I see graphs in here? <laughs> I don't know either. I was expecting a console. Maybe it's or this are unaccelerated. Is, you know, this, I, just, like, I figured I have to post this. Oh my god, this is so good. Okay. Uh, this is a good one, Chris, about the uh, very log, uh, sorry, the uh, whatever this name is. Uh, uh, I should know the name. Uh, tool chain? Sure, sure. Uh, links, okay. Yep. Yeah, their tool chain has always been awful, by the way. It asks any, you know, hardware. Vivado. There we go. Vivado. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, and, and it's getting worse and worse by every year because there's like a single company who owns all of the companies who makes the software for doing digital hardware development, as they call it. So like there's no competition practically, and that's why it keeps getting worse and worse. Um, yeah, okay, that sounds interesting. It might also interest me because next meeting I'm going to have a... Sorry, next week I'm going to have a meeting with a bunch of scientists who are hardware engineers. Um, and they're very much interested in FreeBSD in this because they liked the, because we I, I gave a demo a couple of weeks ago about RTIO, RT, remind me how that was, Jan, Re, real time, the real, oh, God damn it. There was the RT IW, 
Uh, yeah, RT Prio, yeah, RT Prio and Idle Prio. And, you know, with that, you can do a lot of interesting things, and they got very interested in that. So uh, they're also looking forward in having some kind of hardware development environment on FreeBSD. So let's see how that goes. I recommend if you want your users to use it to set this SysCTL to run so okay. that if they have a big batch job to run on the workstation or server, yeah. um, with this SysCTL set to one, it, uh, reducing the priority uh, into the idle priority range oh. uh, is no longer a privileged operation. Mm -hmm. um, it means that you can easily use it for inside jails. You can uh, use it as a normal user. Everyone yeah. gets to uh, deprioritize their processes. Yeah. And that's useful for them if they have, for example, a big optimization job to run or just your normal routing, which can take hours or days, depending on the size of your project. And yeah. It's also just useful if you have a build server for Podia or some other stuff so that you can reduce priority because uh, the old way of just in running it with nice is uh, not useful on a high core count FreeBSD system mm -hmm. because the FreeBSD scheduler has a, for scalability reasons necessary, a scheduler queue per, per core or oh. per logical core. So with hyperthreading enabled one per hyperthread. And the niceness is only applied uh, per queue. So if you have lots of uh, cores, you have lots of very short run queues, hopefully, and changing priority within those is not uh, useful. You have to really make it possible to preempt the preemptively change jobs it. and uh, maybe even just steal work from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. or and um, yeah, so you want to use idle priority it. because it yeah. has um, a yeah, no, impact. Okay. That does remind me. So I'm just going over the chat with my uh, team members here. And um, a, a while back, we had we saw this interesting issue where, where we did a, a network test between two um, uh, machines, physical machines. One of them was FreeBSD. The other one was also FreeBSD, actually. And it would go like, you know, 9.9 .9 gigabit per second. It would go like that for like, you know, three seconds. And then it would drop back down to eight, go back to nine, drop down to six, go back to nine. You know, it was very messy. And then I just thought as an idea that, hey, maybe I should enable power D and set it to always be on maximum. And um, we never saw that issue again. Does that make sense? Not directly. Uh, it could just be that you're hiding the symptom. Uh, what you're describing sounds like you're having the occasional dropped frame, which then as it should, triggers the congestion control algorithm. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing is a single flow just running against the uh, congestion control limit, getting uh, throttled down a pack, and then slowly um, taking up the full link capacity again. That's interesting. Uh, that's kind of um, expected behavior if you actually drop packets. Yeah. And, uh, and that's totally possible and don't really, so um, if you need maximum throughput with a single connection so then look into different either figure out if you can get rid of the occasional packet drops mm -hmm. or uh, use a more tolerant congestion control algorithm yeah or tune it so that it hides uh, the issue um, what kind of hardware and, was this and As how he could just basically throttle yeah, the yes, system sir. up and down yes. so that it uh, doesn't let me go, drop the packet. Let me go to the machine. Uh, wait, not that one. Nope, not that one either. Okay, this one. Uh, LSPCI. No, damn it. PCI conf. Sorry, I've been Linuxing for a while. I'm sorry. I apologize. I've been a naughty boy. Um, let's Linux see. happens. I know, right? Uh, We're still seeing your browser if you want to share your console or something. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, it's a Chelsea Accord T520CR. 
So Chelsea LT 520CR, yeah. That's the one that we had an issue with. And uh, after I changed the power deconfig, let me check in my RC conf. We changed it to A max. And for some reason, I also have dash M2000. I don't remember what that for. I think that's the megahertz, right? Maybe that's why it's M. Um, or is that the minimum? Are oh, no, that's the minimum. The, um, yep. Are you running the base system power D or power D plus plus from port? No, I'm doing I'm doing the base system. I'm not, I'm not doing power D. How many cores does the system have? Uh, with hi hyper threading. With hyper threading, it has uh, two hundred fifty two hundred two hundred fifty. Okay, in that case, the base system power D is completely useless. Okay. Because it will run at full speed basically all the time. Okay. The reason for that is that the base system power D is uh, kind of broken by design on modern hardware because it takes the sum of basically all CPU cores and then uh, of a load on all cores and then uh, basically it says, how fast would I have to run a single CPU mm -hmm. to uh, handle that load? Mm -hmm. And then tries to configure that uh, frequency uh, which then gets capped by the frequency driver. So uh, basically, if you have half a percent of system load on all 200 something cores, you're above 100%. Uh, and then the system tries to, to run at full speed all the time. Mm. So what you effectively do are doing by power by running PowerD at all, is to bump the uh, CPU uh, frequency uh, control from base clock to turbo, and that's it. Uh, because it will never go below that until you, unless you are really, really careful to not have any background processes ever wake up. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. And the kind of solution for that is that you can run the uh, better power D uh, from ports, which uh, doesn't um, just add up, but computes the maximum per core. Basically, it checks oh, how fast would I have to run the highest loaded core. And it's also nice, especially for very thin laptops, because you can configure it not just with minimum and maximum frequencies, but also with minimum and maximum firmers so that you can avoid running into the hardware enforced self protection uh, and instead throttle gracefully if you have a too thin laptop, um, mm -hmm. which is the same behavior other operating systems uh, have to do on those systems. And that can really help on a thin uh, ultra buck or something to get. Uh, good sustained throughput because otherwise you will have a short burst of performance and then run into the uh, hardware self-protection uh, where it throttles inefficiently and very hard. Um, it's better to have it uh, just hover close to the hardware self-protection uh, temperature. Um, yeah, um, so and incidentally, but okay. the next problem is that on modern ish systems like Skylake or uh, Zen, uh, you normally don't have to do uh, that power D stuff in uh, user land because they have firmware which responds in, uh, hundreds of the time a normal power management daemon yeah. does. So just configure yeah. the performance goals. Uh, there and then the course should uh, photo themselves correctly. Yeah. Andy, you were saying something? So, yeah, you had mentioned uh, this is kind of a little off topic. You had mentioned the software related to um, doing um, FPGA stuff. Yes. And how um, I don't know so much about FPGA, but there's a group that's doing ASICs? 
Okay. And so they've got a lot of good software resources. I know they've got some on converting FPGAs to ASIC. Uh, they're called tinytapeout.com. You might be interested in seeing Tiny... some of their information. Tiny tape out. Basically tape what they're out. doing is is they're taking uh they're having people take a chunks of a chip. Nice. And then you can use your chunk, but they might have some resources that can get you some some open source stuff able to do it to do that kind of thing. Nice. So I thought I'd mention it. Thank um, you. I have to st I have to step out. It's because it's one o'clock now. So I will talk to you guys later. No, it's one in the afternoon. Oh, okay. But if I if I don't leave now, I don't get I won't get lunch. <laughs> okay. Well, bon appetit. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers. Uh, John, uh, why, uh, why were you asking about the uh, neck? Uh, I was wondering that. Um, almost. Uh, I have seen networking related performance problems over the years. Um, but I, I also, I am a big Chelsea user. I, I really do like their hardware. Yeah. Um, I tend to use a large uh, number of either Dell or Super Microsystems, um, and I almost always uh, end up going into the bias of these systems and setting them to uh, the equivalent of whatever their maximum performance setting is. Oh, um, no, that's a good point. I've never checked ours. I and... do. I do agree with with with. Uh, with the statements about Power D, I have messed around with Power D a lot in the past, and I basically don't touch it anymore. Um, and I that was the kind of the genesis of my question. Um, that's just kind of years of experience and tired of getting burned by it. And um, I have people using boxes and running test cases that. Um, you know, if they don't get the same numbers uh, two times in a row, they, they come looking. Um, I see. Antonik, um, the two tools I found most useful to figure out what speed the system is actually running at uh, in the base system is either just the diagnostic page from, uh, from M prime, which works surprisingly well at figuring out the actual uh, speed of the CPU right now. Mm -hmm. And if your CPU is supported by it, uh, you can learn even more with TurboStat, uh, which is also available as a port. On some systems, it doesn't work because it basically goes so deep into the CPU registers that at least it's read-only, so it's not dangerous, but uh, that it really has to know your microarchitecture family to do what it does. Um, at worst, it just crashes with a null pointer dereference or a division by zero or something. Uh, but then, yeah, you try to decode the data and misunderstood it. Um, on an Intel system, especially, you can see a very fine granular basically per power domain, the speed and per core. And AMD, it's a bit coarser, I think, at least on FreeBSD, because uh, yeah, the registers just aren't decoded, which encode the same information. But you get more than you need to know the current CPU frequency. And you can easily see the, uh, by just letting it running, uh, letting it run and then spinning up artificial power viruses like OpenSSL, <coughs> Speed, Multi, and CPUs or something, to or, or just a few ones to find out if your CPU is dynamically clocking up and down, if it's uh, going above um, the base clock, uh, and so on. Um, and for thermal monitoring, you may want to look uh, at the IPMI uh, sensor reports because those are the most uh, portable ones to access <laughs> on servers. Just run IPMI tool, uh, SDR or something. Uh, we have the IPMI device, mm -hmm. which works on basically any server, 
on <laughs> over the last several decades uh, if it has an IPMI chip. I mean, you just have to load the IPMI uh, device driver. But it's a fairly simple uh, little uh, driver, so it, I haven't had problems with it on either Dell HP or Supermicro. I use IPMI to... all the time. It works great. I, I second that. And depending on your vendor, you may have a, the option of getting even more reporting, maybe even more sensors than the CPU can even address from the BMC because the BMC is really in control of a server motherboard. The CPU is just thinking that it is the CPU until the uh, BMC says it's time for FMM interrupts uh, and stealing your cycles or stuff like that. And for your high core count systems with pinned uh, Beehive uh, C vCPUs, you may want to change the default uh, system uh, CPU set so that you really make sure that the kernel isn't uh, blocking the CPUs you think you dedicated to uh, a certain CPU, uh, guest CPU. So, yeah. There is also a talk that I saw, by the way, a couple of days ago on, I think it mm -hmm. was on LinkedIn. If anyone has missed it, it's a good talk. I'll just put this in here. Uh, although the um, talk itself says why we use FreeBSD. What did I just copy? I have no idea. Oh, the title. Okay, great. Uh, the title says why we're on FreeBSD, current at Netflix. It's it's really about like with why you should upstream to FreeBSD. Like it's really more like that. And I love it. Uh, I wish they showed a lot more technical details, but it's mostly about like, okay, how do you dissect code and how do you commit to the upstream um, and how do you work with the developers? And also that their team is really tiny. I thought it would be a lot more, but the fact that it's small team makes it even better. Um, they went into details at both BSDCon and EuroBSDCon and some of the talks have been recorded. Uh, the 2019 one from Coimbra, for example, or uh, sorry, 2023 one. Um, and also, uh, apparently, they are using ZFS because I've 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 heard from friends because for years they said that they are using UFS and also send file works with UFS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I I kept wondering, are they using ZFS? I know they use it internally, but are they using anywhere in the uh, open? Connect appliance and uh, only for the operating system. Only for the operating system itself. Yeah, the the data itself is apparently on UFS. Yeah, but the uh, operating one system. One file system per disk. Yep, uh, exactly. Yeah, because it's a effectively a caching appliance. Mm -hmm. They can tolerate uh, losing file systems. So if this, depending on how the drive dies, either the file system gets unmounted or the system crashes and reboots. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, only when there are too few remaining drives do they schedule a re replacement, either of a whole appliance or just the drive, yeah. according to what they do. Yeah. So next time when someone tells you that IX system is, is moving to uh, Linux, tell them that no problems, people's Plex might be Linux, but people's Netflix is still free BSD. Um, they are also using a lot of Linux uh, for all the AWS. cloud yeah. builds yep. because they're running up a applications and build, such. running stuff in Amazon uh, cloud infrastructure, but yeah. Uh, but they also build their, build their own uh, Linux images, by the way, as far as I know, like the AMI stuff that they do, et cetera. Anyway, that's I kind of went on top off topic there. But yeah, it, it was a really good good talk to see there. And um, and the slides are also available, by the way, in the FreeBSD People's page. People's? People? People? People's? People. People page. What's the plural of people? Oh, that's, uh, people is plural. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, people's would be multiple uh, groups of people. Yeah. So, uh, people's would be multiple groups of people. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, in, uh, I mean, like, yeah. The linguist inside of me just died. Part, it's suddenly used. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyone, anything else? 
Uh, this is not beehive related, but go mm -hmm. back to Jan. Um, I was remembering something about IPMI tool and I just uh, did a little test using the SDR command. Um, and there is a difference between running IPMI tool on Linux and running IPMI tool on FreeBSD. Um, the IPMI tool on Linux is providing more uh, usable output. Um, and FreeBSD tends to uh, list a lot of not readable um, values. Okay. And I'm I thought I looked at this uh, many, many years ago. Um, thought it was getting fixed. Could it but be it, that yeah. the port is out of date or not all options enabled or something? Because once you're talking to the BMC, it really shouldn't be much of a common yeah, I'm, issue. I'm, it's the same BMC. The only difference is where I'm running IPMI tool. Um, I'm running on obvious. I'm just running the current IPMI tool out of the pa from package from ports. Just... Uh, does the same also apply when you access the uh, IPMI over the network from FreeBSD, or is it only the? I am. I am used, I am only. I am only doing this over the network. Okay, so it's not a FreeBSD kernel issue. But at most, uh, the port is not up to date, yeah. or maybe the Linux distribution you're using has some distribution patches to add additional instrumentation. That's possible. And I just wanted, I just wanted to say that I'm not asking to have a major follow-up or anything. Um, mm -hmm. Just something I remembered, and I, I do still see some differences. Um, yep. But you had. You'd made the comment about looking at the output of IPMI tool, and there is a lot of information in here um, that's worth looking at. It's worth just uh, searching the first like 10 pages on the search engines of your ch uh, choice, finding the raw IPMI command strings to do some crazy stuff. Yep. Uh, to, for example, configure uh, super microsystems into heavy IO mode. Um, yeah. So that you get enough airflow, because that could be another interesting problem uh, you run into. I've had it happen with an old um, QLogic card that in a desktop case, uh, it was squished up against the case wall and just didn't get enough airflow, because that was one of the early 10 gig cards, which ran very hot because of the, ba the basically um, in a, yeah, fiber channel uh, HBAs uh, pretending to be a NIC. And yeah, so those cards idle at like 15 or 17 watts for a dual port tank card, uh, which doesn't do a lot of fancy offloading. It's just that it's an inefficient early chipset. And with a big Chelsea card, you can run into similar issues that we're either throttling or just crashing or misbehaving under high temperatures if you don't give them the specified amount of airflow. Because you can, of course, cool them passively. Uh, it's expected, but it's also expected yep. that you do that with uh, 100 to 200 linear feet per minute of airflow and not whatever you have in your little... Yep. Uh, home server or hack together system you find in an academic setting. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, at that, that was all. Yep. Standard points, useful points. And there are other <laughs> tools available in ports to uh, read uh, out uh, BMC. And uh, another point is that, but that's highly vendor specific, a lot of recent-ish uh, BMCs support uh, SSH so that you can SSH in and use uh, some kind of CLI uh, so that you don't even have to install an annoying tool. And you can instead just SSH in and uh, look at the systems through a CLI. Right. It's really interesting how vastly different the <coughs> serial uh, over LAN via SSH performance is across vendors. For example, on an old Dell system, it works perfectly. And on something like, an, uh, what was 
AS REC, for example, it has like 300, 400 milliseconds latency on top of whatever you have an actual network latency. Whereas the, on the other hand, the video uh, over LAN works fine and the video console is totally usable, whereas the Dell one isn't. So it's really a crapshoot. I have uh, serial over LAN enabled on all of the systems, um, and most of the current systems work well. There are some older systems that didn't, but most of the new ones do. Yes, but uh, the question is, how do you access the serial over LAN? Because, for example, with uh, Dell Supermicro um, or ASVAC, you can SSH into the BMC to then use you, SSH, you SSH to access into the BMC. The you SSH yes. into the BMC. Um, there is an option on some of the systems that you need to enable port uh, 661 or whatever it is. Um, and once you've done that, Serial Over LAN uh, should work with IPMI. Uh, you also, at least on the Dell boxes, need to go in and enable uh, the console support. Um, and probably setting it to auto will work correctly for um, almost all current systems within the last few years. And on Dell systems, you can even log in via uh, public key uh, to the SSH service running on the BMC. Other that is vendors correct. are restricted to very old ciphers, but it's still better than the cryptography in the uh, IPMI protocol. Because the big problem with the IPMI protocol is that it it's mandatory su to support a challenge response authentication protocol, which requires a BMC to store the plain text password, which is a real horror show when you think about uh, how many uh, operators run the same IPMI password on all of their systems and don't yep. uh, <clears throat> know about that and probably just decommission systems with a little serial flash chip containing the keys to their kingdom. I have no disagreement. Yeah. All right. Well, I thank you guys. It's been Keep good. <laughs> Anyone I anything else? Something to uh, develop nightmares over. <laughs> oh, what? When is our next call? I need a calendar, don't I? Second of Second May. Of May. Okay. So the zero two zero five twenty twenty four. I'll just check your calendar. Later. Okay. Uh, anyone? Anything else? Yep. We're good. Okay. We're closing Nothing up on. on Eighteen twenty-three of UTC. Okay, whatever the rest of the planet is. Sure. Uh well, it thank you all very much. Okay. Uh whoever is on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And thank you for watching for this long. Leave a comment if you have any questions. We actually do read the comments, you know. So feel free to actually, you know, leave a comment for the questions. And uh, yeah, that's that that's it for today.